Hälfte unserer Gesellschaften sind bekannter. Half of our population, as everyone knows, are women. So if women are not equally represented, paid or respected, something is wrong. The state of women's rights is an indicator of where a society stands. It is clear if we want to credibly represent a feminist foreign policy, our team needs to reflect that approach. And nothing illustrates the appeal of our democracy as clearly as a diverse team with the clear message, you are Germany's face abroad, no matter the color of your skin, your gender, your religion, who you love or who your parents are. At the association women at diplo.de, we have been committed to enshrining equality and women's rights also in our foreign policy since 2018. And we are delighted to see that this has been mainstreamed with the FFP guidelines. Compatibility of personal and professional life is not a luxury, but a core human need. It benefits all of us and improves our work. We have adopted a new term in our daily work, that is gender budgeting. We want to take a precise look at what the Foreign Office spends its money on how, and how can we best use that money so that equality is promoted globally and in the best possible way. Our projects directly help women in Nepal. In 10 years of civil war, these women have lived through brutal violence, torture and rape. For the first time now, our partners make their voices he heard. They get psychological and social support. They learn to stand up for their rights and lead a self-determined life. The projects of the embassy, the IFA, and the Civil Peace Service are all pulling in the same direction and thus are also create new momentum for the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Due to the severe drought in Somalia, numerous people had to seek refuge in IDP shelters, where particularly women are hardly protected against assaults. More and more, even younger girls are forced into marriage. Of course, humanitarian aid must always be guided by the needs on the ground, but a feminist foreign policy can make a real difference. Here in New York, we have created a group of states interested in feminist foreign policy from all parts of the world. Our goal is to make the case for feminist approaches in foreign policy in this multilateral environment too. We want to illustrate that a feminist foreign policy is not an elite project of the global north, but that it works for all states and societies by providing a broader basis for foreign policy. In a country where people working on my level are almost exclusively men, I raise some questions. How many women are part of the executive committee or the party leadership? In order to claim women's rights to be respected, we also need strong women's networks. And as an embassy, we provide a safe space for exchange, which is rare here. For us, it is clear a feminist foreign policy overcoming discrimination can only work when we join hands worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event about the guidelines for foreign feminist policy. And I would like to give the floor first to the Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs. Ms. Baerbock, you have the floor. Distinguished guests, and especially today, a warm welcome to my colleagues, because so many of you have contributed to what we have in front of us today, what lies uh, below our chairs, our guidelines for feminist foreign policy. I have to admit that I it was quite astonishing for me to see in this process what kind of trigger word this small word feminist can be. But what we, the goal we pursue with these guidelines is something that should be self-evident in the 21st century. That is, all people 
having the same rights, freedoms and opportunities, regardless of their gender, their religion, who their parents are, what they look like, or who they love. And as we all know, in every country, women make up half of society. Feminist foreign policy, therefore, is not a battle cry, but it is a mandate derived from our basic law in Germany. And it is certainly not some stuff. We're not making a fuss about nothing here. It is a hard security matter, because if women are not safe, no one is safe. This is what a Ukrainian woman told me when we were standing close to the contact line in the Donbass back then, before the 24th of February 2022, before Russia's brutal war of aggression. And this sentence stuck with me ever since, because we all know what came after. War, suffering, terrible violence. And this sentence illustrates that women's rights too often are an indicator of the state of our societies. Too often, internal repression is a warning signal for future external aggression, as was the case with Russia. If women aren't safe, no one is. But what is also true is where women are safe, we are all safer. That is the positive message. We know that peace agreements are more stable when women are involved in drafting them. The likelihood that such agreements hold increases by 20% if women are involved. On the other hand, when large parts of the world population are excluded, we cannot reach lasting peace and security, because justice cannot be granted. And when large parts of the population cannot participate equally, no society can tap its full potential. Economists see a global growth of 26% in three years when women worldwide equally participate in the labor market. This is why feminist foreign policy is in all our interest. It is not, as some say in a bit of an arrogant way, just a question of values. Feminist foreign policy is in our security interest. It is in our economic interest, too rights, representation, resources. This is what feminist foreign policy is about. And these three R's mark our guidelines. As the name tells us, these are lines to guide us. So they are not carved in stone. They are rather an invitation to constantly review what we are doing, to learn from one another, and if necessary, to also correct things reflect what we can do better. Feminist foreign policy is a continuation of what we call gender mainstreaming in domestic policy. Also uh, has been a trigger word a few years ago, so that means a strategic approach to take into account the different life situations of women, um, of, of people, in all their diversity, in all political and social endeavors. Just as the principle of gender justice is based on the awareness that in many areas there is no gender neutral reality, because different genders can be, different people can be affected in different ways by political decisions and administrative acts. And that is why this also holds true in foreign policy. And let me mention here, because some obviously misunderstood this, or what I rather believe want to misunderstand, these guidelines are not a missionary pamphlet with which we naively intend to make the world a better place. On the contrary, what is important for us is that we want to learn from others, because we see that some parts of the world are way ahead of us in some areas. 
if we look at the share of women in the parliaments of Rwanda, Mexico, and South Africa, for example, we it becomes obvious it's much higher than here in Germany. So the more countries are on board, the better we can become. And the good thing is also that we are becoming ever more. At the Munich Security Conference, many of us have met from around the globe, from Spain to Chile to Canada. And at the Munich Security Conference, my colleague from Mongolia told me that she ha is hosting a conference in June on feminist foreign policy because they are the first Asian country to have such a feminist foreign policy. This morning, Svenja Schulze and I presented the guidelines on feminist foreign policy in cabinet and the guidelines on feminist development policy of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development because together we pull in one direction, not only worldwide, but also in the, f in the government. And some might raise the question, some raised this question this morning, not in cabinet, but before many journalists. People ask me whether we haven't always promoted women's rights. Well, this is something we've been doing all the time. What is new about this now? Of course, it's not a revolution. It would be sad if that was necessary, but this I think there are three important things that really make a difference. Firstly, main, we are mainstreaming all three R's, rights, resources, and representation in all political fields. Mainstreaming is also a bit of a complex term. So let me give you some examples to illustrate what we mean. Mainstreaming, for example, means that when we get humanitarian assistance ready for crisis areas, we not only say we give 100 million euros for victims of um, the earthquake or f for people in Yemen, but we ask whom do we want to reach, who lives on the ground in these refugee camps or in the uh, shelters after the earthquake. And we see that it's not only people who look like the three gentlemen in front of me, but also when I look to the right, uh, many women are also there. Uh, and many children, not so many in this room today, but children are so much affected, and an 18-year-old teenager has very different needs than an eight-month-old baby. So when we do mainstreaming and humanitarian assistance, it doesn't mean that some get nothing, the 18-year-old boy or the eight-month-old baby, but that we adapt to that. If there are many babies, we will, of course, uh, provide diapers, nappies, and if there are elderly people, we also need to make funds available for providing mobility aids to some of them. And as everyone knows, half of every society are women, and that also means we need to think of the fact that women have special um, need special hygiene kids, and that also um, applies to refugee camps. Some people would say that's a no-brainer, and I, when I travel, I also look at uh, hotels. I'm, I think it, in hotels, uh, they might be much worse equipped than refugee camps. Of course, there are no hygiene kits in hotels. And it sounds a bit anecdotic, but for me, it really highlights what this is about. It is not, it, uh, it is not a no-brainer. We always need to make it clear to ourselves what it means when we really think of the needs of everybody. On the other hand, mainstreaming can be very easy because it also reflects our own behavior, the way we act. So when we at the Foreign Office deliberately decide when we hire new staff that we want to reach our 50 percent goal, and at the political level it's a bit easier because I can just make that decision, and we travel with a delegation of which half the members are women, starting with my security detail, the political consultants, and the interpreters. And when half of them are women, sometimes there is a coincidence, and there are only uh, only women in my delegation sitting at the table. And that leads to some funny situations. The first sentence on the other side could be, and if by coincidence there are only men, the first reflex would be, uh, after saying good morning, oh, uh, the, the interpreter is uh, ill today, and we haven't even said a word. So this is something that you really cannot underestimate when we speak about representation and mainstreaming. Of course, people are taking a close look at how 
do we arrive, how do we travel? And of course, we have a special um, focus here when uh, we speak about diverse backgrounds. Mainstreaming also means that the needs of women in marginalized groups always need to be included in our thinking, in our approaches, not every now and then. And um, meaning women also means including women. That is a very complex task also in such a big ministry. So for me, part of this includes, and that's my second point, that we have a critical self-reflection process and that we re are really honest about what the first steps are. And that means uh, it is a tough job. We've seen this when it comes to Iran. In November, we have decided to convene a special session of the United Nations Human Rights Council and appoint a commission that will examine the violent crackdown of the protests. And to be honest, even at the day of the vote, when I entered that hall and was about to give my speech, we didn't know what the result of this vote would be. And many, when we said we need to take this to the Human Rights Council, uh, had really advised us strongly against moving forward. We don't know whether we will get enough votes. We won't. We don't know what that, what signal that would uh, would be. But part of this is also this is also part of feminist foreign policy. For me, launching things, even if you cannot be sure that you will be successful immediately, being willing to push through, go the extra mile, even if you could fail or fail, because going the extra mile already changes something. So uh, some of us present here and myself, we made phone calls 24-7. Uh, Our ambassador in Geneva talked to each individual ambassador, uh, met over a cup of coffee to get our partners on board. And in the end, the result was a success for us, 25 yes votes, 6 nay, and 16 abstentions. And especially the 16 abstentions were the real success, because countries and people whom we had talked to directly told us, well, actually, I cannot support this violence with a nay vote, this violence that we see in Iran. And that was important. But, of course, some of uh, you are present here today. The question was raised, what is the consequence of this? And we see that the Commission is now gathering um, evidence, uh, but, we, um, but it still is a long way to go, and we're not naive. Feminist foreign policy does not mean that addressing a topic will to lead to success immediately. Feminist foreign policy is no magic wand with which we can charm away all wrongs in the world in the blink of an eye. No, feminist foreign policy is marked by the fact that it requires stamina. So it needs to pragmatically gauge what is realistically possible. And that also means that we need to bear with dilemmas and that we need to face uh, dilemmas. And we, if we would shy away from that, if we, would, if we were to say we'd rather not address this and do, do such trade-offs, something that happened in the past might happen again, that women's rights issues fall by the wayside. And for me, this became very clear when we looked to Afghanistan. And the first R, the rights of people. When the Taliban came to power again, we could see how massively uh, women's rights were trampled on. Access to school is denied, access to universities, even a walk in the park. And around Christmas, we got the news that women were no longer able to work, especially in humanitarian assistance and health care, food sales, because women were no longer supposed to work in these areas. And then we needed to see what we could do. Of course, first we condemned that. But the question that then came up really shows whether you're willing to address this dilemma or not. The question came up of what, do we just continue the payments? And 
being ready to think this through, knowing that it will be a very tough decision to take, that was feminist foreign policy to me. That's where it starts, not just announcing great results once the process is over, but asking difficult questions. And this is why we, why I as a foreign minister, raised the question at the United Nations. I asked, what do we do? Do we just continue the payments? And that would mean that we were paying women for staying at home in their domestic prison, as many perceive it. And of course, then the question came up, if we don't give money anymore, what will happen to these people? We're talking about 26 million people here who rely on humanitarian assistance. Do we also, don't we um, leave women and children alone here? And we could just have gone the easy way. We could have say, pretended not to see the problem. We would could have told the Taliban, or we could have told the Taliban we'll just continue with the payments. Of course, um, we pay money to different organizations um, from the United Nations. But if you are really committed to feminist foreign policy, as we do, we said we will not turn a blind eye to that question. And we really thought it through. And when we did, the question no longer was whether we would uh, leave behind 26 million people. If you think this through, if women can no longer work in humanitarian assistance, in health care, in water supply, food supply, um, women in Afghanistan cannot be reached because women are not allowed to receive food from foreign men. So we would have punished women and children twice, and that was very difficult. And some people told me, oh, yeah, now she comes uh, with her women's issues and lets uh, women and girls uh, fall by the wayside. But what we reached by raising these critical questions within the EU, within the UN, was we cannot dodge away from this question. We are facing this question. We are facing up to it. And we made it clear to the Taliban that we cannot accept that women can no longer work there, are not allowed to work there, because then there won't be a healthcare system because you want this. And luckily, and we couldn't know that um, from the start, we were now able to reach women being employed in these areas. So we can provide humanitarian assistance in this field, in this field, reaching 26 million people. Of course, we don't know how long this will last. But what I know is that we will continue to care because others care as well. The Houthis in the north of Yemen had started with a similar approach and had followed very closely what we did. And had we accepted, things would have been different. It was very clear. We said we will not accept women being excluded. And at the same time, of course, we do everything we can to reach the 26 million people who depend on our inter international assistance. This also illustrates that feminist foreign policy is not an easy thing to do. It is connected with very difficult decisions because it is not about, about nice words. It is about real problems of real people. It is about real feminism. <coughs> and we will adapt our tools to that. And that is my third point. That brings me to the third R, the resources, gender budgeting, another uh, rather a, a term that's rather difficult to grasp. In our guidelines, we have set ourselves the goal, and the Federal Ministry of Development Cooperation did the same, that by the end of this legislative period, we want 85 percent of the projects we fund to be gender sensitive and 8 percent to be gender transformative. Gender sensitive does not mean that from now on support only is given to women. Don't be afraid, and I read that in the newspaper as well. Uh, Ms. Baerbock, don't forget about the men. Don't, um, don't be afraid. Everybody will receive our aid. Everybody will continue to receive our assistance because feminist foreign policy is not about reaching fewer people, but more people, all people in a society. And it is also about creating transparency. When we know with which funds we reach whom and how our money is being spent, we also get more clarity. Um, our funds will be used in a more efficient way. 
when we help rebuilding a village in the northeast of Nigeria that had been burned to the ground a few years before by Boko Haram. It is very important for us to know who is planning this village, who is included in the planning process, who provides the ideas and who is implementing this. Because, of course, you could just give the necessary money, task an architect we've known forever and has done a great job um, with building this village, or you can turn to the people on the ground and ask them, who would you like to plan this village? And in Nigeria, the villagers told us, we know a Nigerian female architect and we would like to do the project with her. And she asked the different villagers, what is important to you? When we build a road, when we build a street, what is important for you? When we look at high hygienic or sanitary installations, where should they be placed? And I think a few decades ago, people would have said, don't ask all of them, that's too time consuming, It's uh, it costs too much money. We've uh, prepared everything ourselves. But I also bet that this village would have looked very differently. To our big surprise, too, the women on the ground wanted their houses, small houses, to be surrounded with a relatively high wall because they had seen firsthand what it means when Boko Haram uh, runs into their village and can immediately access their house. And none of us would have built high walls around these new houses. But that led to the fact that all villagers, especially the women and the children, went back to that village. And I also think that the water and hygienic installations would have been placed in different places if you hadn't asked the villagers themselves. Because, of course, for a child, a 10-year-old child or a woman, it makes a huge difference whether the well is in the middle of the village, whether the toilets are placed in the middle or at the end of the village. And according to German hygiene standards or for um, smelling reasons, you would say you would place them at the exit, but it is a, might be a dark space. And gender sensitivity means that we are more sensitive, that we take a closer look at what the needs of everyone are, and that this way our assistance is used in a more effective way. So gender budgeting is in our very own economic interest too. Listening, giving those a voice who speak with a lower voice or are forced to lower their voices. Initiate change together. This is what feminist foreign policy is about. And of course, this important work starts with us. If we are honest and not just embellish things, saying, well, we only have 26% of women in our embassy staff because women did not apply for these jobs. But if we ask why this is the case, the work only starts. Out of 226 missions abroad, only 60 are led by women ambassadors. And this is not a coincidence. There are structural reasons for that. And we need to address these structural reasons, even though it is hard for us, because we need to ask ourselves why at one of our embassies in an, in an EU member state recently, at an event, another ambassador had to be uninvited and be able to bear the answer because he could not access our residence with his wheelchair. And this is what we want to change. It was no coincidence that he couldn't come. It was a structural hurdle. It was a hurdle, structural discrimination. And this is why feminist foreign policy for us at the Foreign Office means it is a tough job and that we need to make sure that all of our staff like coming to work every morning, hopefully, and that they all have easy access and that they are treated equally and that there are no structural hurdles in their way, be it physical hurdles, psychological hurdles, or as colleagues 
rightly complain about uh, a lack of telephone equipment for uh, staff, members of our, of our staff with a hearing impairment, or whether these hurdles are invisible, like glass ceilings. We want to work on changing this, and many colleagues from the Bundestag are present here today. They have raised um, written questions, and I hope they will also raise questions in the future about how far we have come with our 26% uh, and how much progress we've made. And so we decided uh, the 85% of gender sensitive projects are not 100. I hope we can reach the 85%. I hope we can get close. We will have to really go the extra mile. But it is important that we take the first step, that we don't shy away from it back down or fear that we might not reach 100% at the end of the process. Because yes, it is true, if women are safe, everyone is safe, everyone is safer. What is also true, however, if we want to pursue a policy that reaches exactly this, that cares for the security of everyone in our society, we too need to reflect our society in all its diversity. A policy that is inclusive, not exclusive. A policy by all, for all. 84 million, loud or quiet. The better we represent them, the better we too can represent our country in the world. This is feminist foreign policy in today's world for me in the 21st century. This is a foreign policy in today's world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for presenting to us the guidelines with regard to the norms, the structures, but also the concrete contents. I think f many people might have a vague idea of what feminist foreign policy might be about, but they will have a clearer idea now. We would now like to take a closer look at feminist foreign policy. I'm afraid we have to close on time at 3 p.m., that is. Um, we don't have that much time, but I'm nevertheless delighted that the Foreign Office has been uh, successful in getting together quite a prominent and uh, knowledgeable um, panel. Lieutenant Commander Mariga Braga, who is with the Department of Peacekeeping Corporations of the UN Headquarters. Then uh, next, Veronica Zepkalo. I'm pleased, I have to make that point here, that uh, Veronika Zepkaro is here today because she unfortunately had to hear bad news today. On her wedding day anniversary, uh, her husband has been charged on 12 counts, amongst them treason, which um, is tied to capital punish punishment in Belarus. A most warm welcome to you, Ms. Zepkaro. And I'd also like to ask another woman to come up here and join us, who is very knowledgeable about feminist foreign policy in Germany, Christina Lunz, the founder and director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Mrs. Lunz, you please join us. And then I would like to welcome Sanam Naragi Andalini, the founder and director of the International Civil Society Action Network. I can in Washington, D.C. A warm welcome to you. And last but not least, Volker Jacobi, the founder of the European Center of Excellence for Civilian Crisis Management in Berlin. A very warm welcome to you, too. As I said, um, time is of the essence, so let me jump right into the heart of the matter and uh, address a question to you, Ms. Naragi. Andalini, uh, 
The minister mentioned dilemmas that are linked to foreign policy decisions. Now, when we take a closer look at Iran or Afghanistan, would you say that feminist foreign policy can actually lead to substantive change and improve the situation of women in these countries? And, of course, another question that comes up in this context, what can feminist foreign policy do just now in these countries in order to improve the situation of women in these countries? I know important questions, and you have only three minutes to answer. Three minutes. Excellent. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, I want to thank the government of Germany in the context of Afghanistan. Um, ICANN was, has been involved in helping Afghan women, especially Afghan women peace builders, and of course, in August of 2021, many, many were at risk. We work with many governments. The only government that stood by their commitment to help evacuate those that were most at risk is the government of Germany. And um, you have helped us at least save over a thousand lives. And, and I can't thank you enough for that because literally no other country has done that. Um, so thank you very much. Um, to, to your point, uh, I always ask this, I say, if Afghan women peace builders had been a separate delegation in the Doha talks, do we think that the Taliban would have taken over in the way that they did? Put your hand up if you do, because that really is the answer to your question. We have to have women who become peace builders in their own countries present in peace negotiations, whether it's Afghanistan two years ago, Ukraine, whenever that happens, Yemen, et cetera, et cetera. They don't just come in to talk about women, they come in to talk about the needs of their communities because they are actually the ones that are taking on the responsibility to protect. And that's a really important sort of piece of the puzzle here. Um, in terms of the question of Iran, today the news that we're getting is that girls' schools across the country are being poisoned. Our girls are being poisoned. Um, this has to be part of the fact-finding missions and, and the investigations that go on in terms of human rights. Uh, we need to make sure that the voices of women leaders in Iran, the ones who've been in jail, are really shaping and informing the policies that, that we have. So what's coming from inside should be shaping what's coming from outside. On the JCPOA, which is the biggest contentious issue, um, here are a couple of thoughts that I have. One. If there is going to be a negotiation, please make sure that the sanctions relief package that Germany and others would provide doesn't benefit the state, but benefits the public. Because up to now, wherever we've had sanctions, whether it's Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, or elsewhere, the public is actually really badly damaged. And authoritarian states benefit from that because they don't care about their people. Saddam Hussein didn't care about his people. Uh, the Assad doesn't care about his people, it goes on and on. So if we're going to give sanctions relief, make sure that it is to the benefit of the Iranian public, some kind of escrow program that is for humanitarian issues and for families. Secondly, if there is no JCPOA, let's make sure that nobody in the region or out, out of the region actually bombs Iran in the name of peace or in the name of human rights, or in the name of women, peace, uh, life, and freedom, because that's also an, a threat that, that exists there. So it is difficult, but I think that the question is, when we listen and, and, and navigate through the voices of women's networks and, and civil society, and this is the last point I want to make, you, you come up with innovative solutions, and you come up with the voices that are very practical. Fem feminist policies aren't ideological. They are highly, highly practical because women are really practical. So that's one thing. Secondly, one my last point, Please. strong men and authoritarian states are really afraid of women. You got to ask them why, but let's support them because it really is the force of darkness and the force of light. And when, when women are in the leadership, they are, it's about radical transformation and radical equality. It's about not wanting our boys or our girls going to war and facing violence. So think about it. They are afraid of women, so let's stand with women wherever we can. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to address another aspect 
Ms. Tepkalo, the question of representation. How important do you think is gender equality in a society and how do societies change as a consequence? And I'm asking you that question against the backdrop of the issue of to what extend uh, this could help change the situation in your country if there were greater gender equality. Okay. Hello. Good day. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for this great initiative because, as I mentioned before, I'm coming from Belarus, the country where we can only dream about the equality in our society. If you look at our laws, at our constitution, on the paper everything looks just fine. We have the same, we have the equal rights with the men. But in reality, we never had the equal rights with the, with the men. And the example of 2020 presidential elections in Belarus demonstrates, showed case how it works in Belarus. Uh, uh, our president Lukashenko, so-called president Lukashenko, he always, for many, many years, he was humiliating women. He said that uh, Belarus constitution was not adapted for women. And when the presidential elections uh, start, started in Belarus, he, what he did, the first thing, he made sure that all the strong candidates were not registered. And this is when me, together with Svetlana Tikhanovska and Maria Kalesnikova, we stood up in the front of the dictatorship, in the front of, in the fr front of this person, and we uh, continued our fight. It was a complete shock for Lukashenko, because for many, many years he knew how to fight with a man, but he never knew how to fight with the women, because women were not part of the society, I mean, active part of the society. Therefore, with our example, we set, we set up an example in our society that women, we can be a driving force in politics, in economy, in the social life, anywhere, anywhere. Today, the situation in Belarus, unfortunately, is getting much worse. As of today, we have uh, more than 45,000 people went through illegal imprisonment. Uh, Lukashenko once he said he never fights with the women, but the numbers, the figures demonstrate completely opposite. Today we have 192 political female, uh, female uh, ladies in the prisons, and this number increases every day. The total number of political prisoners in Belarus is more than 1,700, and this number increases every day. Lukashenko dragged our country into, into this bloody war in the Ukraine, which is not what all Belarusian people want. We want to have peace, we want to have independence, we want to have a uh, right to, be, to choose the president, we want to, we want to live in a nice democratic country. Therefore, my strong belief, the more country and society are inclusive, the more country is developed and successful. There, therefore, for us, it's a big example. Germany is a big example. Scandinavian countries is a big example how women can influence politics, how women can influence social life, how women can contribute to the uh, life of the society in their countries. Therefore, please, we appeal to international community, we appeal to German government, please help us to open a criminal charge against Lukashenko because we believe once he's, we, he steps of, uh, of the power and women be part of this society, we will build, we will manage to build a country with the freedoms and uh, uh, democratic rights. That's why please help us, do not leave us in this fight because we understand Ukraine is on a, is a top agenda, of course, because of the war, but please, please do not forget about our our people, about our women, about uh, the situation in Belarus, and the situation is much deteriorating each and every day. Please stand with us. Thank you very much. If I may, I would like to take the next two questions and direct them more to the military aspects of security and peace agreements. If I may address a question to Lieutenant Commander Masia Braga. She has a very comprehensive operational experience. Uh, what difference does it make if women and marginalized groups are included in peace negotiations and also in peacekeeping to a greater extent than has been the case in the past? It's a very important objective of the agenda for women and peace. How does it change in a positive way probably the aspects of peace negotiations and the aspects of peacekeeping? First of all, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, it makes all the difference. Uh, without the participation of all the segments of the communities that you serve, we can't have sustainable peace. Uh, we need to have men, women, and uh, marginalized groups as well 
uh, being part of this process, equally represented. Uh, it's the way to understand uh, the most vulnerable groups, uh, the sensitive areas, the threats facing them, which is crucial for prevention and protection of civilians, and also for the stabilization of the country. So, uh, in, when I was in MINUSCA, uh, we developed an action plan, and the idea was to ensure that uh, gender perspective was uh, being part of the peacekeeping operations in, in the Central African. And uh, it, it, this action plan had five stairs, steps. The first one was preparing uh, the teams and ensuring that we had uh, gender advisors in sectors and the uh, focal points in battalions. And uh, ensuring that the, 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 the gender perspective was in place. So, for example, uh, gender uh, sensitive patrols, that was a moment that you could see the most vulnerable groups. And in Central Africa, during my patrols, it was very clear that women were very exposed. So they were disproportionately affected by the conflict. We could see all the time uh, women and children moving and uh, looking for water, looking for firewood, and assessing their farms. And uh, there was no option. So they were all the time very exposed, and it, this kind of formation was very important to be used in the military plan, to reinforce our positions in these areas. And uh, also part of this action plan was uh, to listen to local women organizations, a moment that really could understand how the conflict was affecting them. It was the moment that I could understand better what was happening, and uh, prepare measures to protect them. It was also part information sharing that was a very sensitive part, and how to report the ones that need to receive this information, to have um, gender disaggregated data, for example. Uh, sometimes we receive reports that uh, 20 civilians were killed, but how many women, men, boys and girls? It's information important to understand, for example, it was a gender-based violence. And also to be more effective if you understand the most vulnerable groups. Uh, gender mainstreaming was also part of this, so it was really important to have uh, uh, gender and all these, these, these measures in our documents, that it was gender sensitive. So, for example, uh, in the, the uh, OP order, the, the operation order, the, the fragos, and all the documents. Another important part of this action plan was the engagement scenes. And uh, this was the moment that we engaged with local communities so to understand their concerns. But not only this, to include the local communities in the peace process. It was very important because in one moment, the mission will leave, you are there to support, and the country will continue. So it was very important to have all this participation of local communities. So this, this was the way that the very, it continues now. We have all these gender advisors working and uh, lots of documents and the training to be prepared to, to deal with these aspects. But I'd like to say also that it's a top priority for the Department of Peace Operations. It's part of the, the action for peacekeeping and the only way to be effective on peacekeeping. Thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed. As I said, we would like to focus on the security aspects now, so my next question goes to Mr. Jacobi. Um, what are your ideas about a feminist foreign policy and integrating feminist foreign policy into the general um, security policy of the United Nations? Take a country like Sweden, a country that has uh, been adhering to feminist foreign policy for years and is in a way in a vanguard in the implementation of UN Resolution 1325. What can the United uh, European Union, what can we Germans do, the Fed, what can the Foreign Office do to learn from their experience? Thank you for the interesting question and also thank you for inviting me here today. I can only subscribe to what has been said uh, by previous speakers. The challenges are identical to those uh, that the UN and other organizations face 
when it comes to participation and equal representation for women and men in these missions. The missions of the European Union, the civilian missions that is in particular, uh, constitute the core instrument of uh, the common foreign and security policy, um, the common um, security and defence policy of the European Union. And I hope that at some point uh, in time I will be in a position to say that there is a common um, feminist foreign policy of the European Union and security policy of the European Union. Hannah Neumann, the EP uh, member, suggested uh, this uh, quite some time ago, so it's not a new idea. My wish would be that we, and that includes Germany, in the European Union, um, improve our representation of women in these missions. Do we have enough women? No. Does Germany provide a second enough women? The answer, unfortunately, is also no. So, as regards the civilian non-military uh, um, engagement, uh, the SIF that is, the situation is much better, but when you look to the police forces, it's really, really not good. There are ample reasons why that is the case. And I would like us to think about how we can make sure that connected actions and connected things thinking within Germany can be improved because the personnel that has to work for the European Union is mainly from the judicial sector and the domestic sector, uh, not uniformed forces are the majority of them. What we need are to integrate and connect our thinking here. It's nothing new, I'm telling you, in order to ensure that we have a greater representation also of women in these um, organisations, thus also having credibility as we engage with our counterparts. Thank you. Ms. Lunds, my question to you is whether you can give us a concrete example that illustrates what it means for women and marginalized groups to be cut off from access to resources. And the question is, what influence, because the minister pointed to this, what influence does gender budgeting have on changing that situation? I'm very happy to talk about resources, but before I do so, I'd like to congratulate the minister and the federal foreign minister on having taken this very courageous step. Not only are you the first woman in the 250-year-old history of the ministry, but the first woman to take this very brave step. And it is a dual burden. Uh, one has to acknowledge that. I the, minister. the minister gave us excellent examples for gender budgeting, spreading the funds in a way that all groups of society benefit, not only the traditional ones, as has been the traditional practice group from the global north mainly, privileged and uh, benefiting more than others. I want to be pushy, and it is I see it as my task to be a bit pushy uh, as I talk about these things and also take it to a somewhat uh, superior level. Foreign policy, you know, as I say, Germany wants to achieve peace and stability, and uh, research goes to show that this is only possible if we reduce patriarchal structures in countries and use funds and invest them in a way that they are drawn out of the strengthening of patriarchal structures, especially in violent societies. In 2021, this became obvious. It was the second year of the pandemic where we didn't have enough funds globally to s distribute enough um, vaccines across the globe. That was the year where we had the highest numbers ever that went into military expenditure. Two billion US dollars was the global number reached. At the same time, 6.5 billion US dollars were dedicated by the UN to peace efforts, less than 0.4% of what was spent on militarization and defense. A feminist foreign policy wants to achieve a long-term transformation ensure, to ensure that we can create stable uh, circumstances for people to live in. Thus, funds have to go in a way that uh, fund stable societies, as do the United Nations, by strengthening women's rights, human rights at a global level, and by ensuring that this 
potential for violence which has doubled in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years, conflicts, global conflicts have increased, have doubled from 30 to 60. Uh, a million to, and the number of refugees has also doubled to roughly 80 million people. So feminist foreign policy has to ensure that we do whatever we can to get violence out of our societies and to focus on human rights. And I'm so happy about these guidelines because they have opened a door. It is what's now, something has happened that hasn't happened to me for 30 years. I am moderating, and the organizers say you have an additional 10 minutes. I'm very grateful for that. And it provides me with the opportunity to ask you a question, Madam Minister, uh, bringing things to a head, if I may. For almost a year now, for more than a year now, we have been confronted with Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. We hear, OK, feminist foreign policy. And this tough security policy we've been pursuing for a year now, this doesn't go together. What is your response to those critical voices? In a nutshell, that these are about two sides of the same coin. Investing in military, Christina Lunds was very clear in that regard, is not an end in itself because we think it's a wonderful thing. We believe that it serves our ability to defend ourselves. And this is why the federal government, in the face of our European peaceful order being attacked, um, wanted to make sure that we invest into our ability to defend ourselves by making 100 billion euros available. And we also invest in strengthening Ukraine's ability to defend itself. Both serve the protection of peace. And if there is massive breach of rules, and the same goes for the domestic policy. This is why I'm so fond of giving you domestic examples. We have the monopoly over power in our country. That is with the government, with the police authorities. And of course, a police officer cannot just draw his gun without any substantiated reason. And the same goes for other sectors. But in emergency situations, if they're confronted with the worst violation of rules, uh, the police officers are committed, are um, obliged to intervene to protect the victim, because otherwise they would refrain from assisting them. That would be a criminal act in Germany, especially if you were to do it whilst being in office and being serving, so to speak. Thus, at the international level, we are experiencing something of the same. When everyone lives in peace, though, feminist foreign policy would mean investing in disarmament. Thus, I traveled to Geneva just recently uh, to attend a disarmament conference, a world with fewer nuclear weapons, and this is why we want to prevent Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon, is the world in which there is more peace. If someone uses these weapons in order to ensure that he can continue to breach international rules, if that occurs, we are obliged, obligated to assist the victims and to help Ukraine defend itself, equip them, because if we were not do so, we would have abstained from providing the necessary assistance. So both go to better for me, a feminist foreign policy, mentioning people being raped and abused in a war. Yes, in a war situation too, abuse is not uh, uh, an everyday occurrence, it is a war crime and has to be um, investigated and prosecuted. And then again, to come back to our very own interest um, in supplying weapons to Ukraine, we assist Ukraine. We provide self for self-help, uh, for the right to execute their right of exercise, their right to self-defense. But it is in our very own interest in the hope that this war is not going to spread to other countries. And this is why I'm so grateful that um, the military aspects have been underlined in the Federal Armed Forces, in NATO, in international UN missions. Um, we now have women participate in these missions, not because it is a nice idea, but because they make the mission stronger, more robust. Uh, in situations where we were confronted with um, suicide um, attackers, uh, where we are confronted in countries with this, a male um, army member cannot just search a woman. You need female members of the army or the federal armed forces to be able to do so. An army without women would thus become a weaker army than one with women. And uh, our objective is to also achieve gender equality there, because we believe that to be in our very own security interest. Thank you. Before, ich, uh Before I hand the floor to someone from the audience, would ask them to come up here and join us. A, 
speed round, excluding the minister. Um, one sentence. In res when you are not yet convinced of feminist foreign policy making sense, one sentence that you would reply to that person. No Thomas Mann sentences that extend over three pages, please. Ich finde I think that substance speaks for itself, whether you call it feminist foreign policy, full stop, two sentences. Ms. Lunds, feminism, feminist foreign policy um, works against violent structures. If we want long-term peace, it cannot be achieved without feminism. Lieutenant Commander Braga. Sie macht unsere Gesellschaften gerechter und stärker. Women are power and women in solidarity, when women uh, work together, we are superpower. So let's <laughs> fight for our solidarity and superpowers. Right. In the past 15 years, we have started many, many wars and we haven't stopped them. So. To me, feminist foreign policy is actually a reform of how we think about diplomacy, about how we bring the voices of people who care about peace and who are peace actors on the ground when we're not there to the tables to ensure sustainable peace. That's what we need to do because the way we've been doing it up to now Point. is failing. Point. Thank you. I would like to ask Dusen Tekal to join us here from Hava.help and ask her to briefly give us her uh, thoughts and her impressions at what she has heard so far on the guidelines on feminist foreign policy. Three minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be asked to break this down as an organization that has been founded in the face of a genocide. I'm talking the Yazidis here, the religious community of the Yazidis. Feminist foreign policy is for us serious human rights policy. It's not just uh, dabbling with uh, politics, but it also includes defending international law if a continuing genocide happens, as it's the case, and was the case with the Yazidian bombers. And Ukraine is a case in point. It shows how important this is. People tend to say this is a, a construct. It's, it's nothing to do with my reality. But the opposite is the case. Along the lines of what Christina Lunds just said, I'm very grateful that the political will is there, that we have a foreign minister here who takes this seriously. And I have to be very honest that um, the flag she gets uh, is an indication of this being actually a revolutionary spirit that is being uh, expressed here. As I said, what does it mean for us? For us, it means that women are being empowered to speak out on their own behalf. And this goes for the women in the Global South. Feminist foreign policy is not just about gender equality, but intersectionality has to be applied in a way that the women from their own regions, the brave and courageous Iranians, Afghans, Yazidian women, become agents of, of change. And we have to strengthen these structures. The women say to us, you know, we don't care what you call it. We don't know the names. We just want to improve the circumstances in which we live. We want to live in peace. We want to be able to feel hope, and we want to prepare a future for our children. And a time where women are being poisoned simply for being women, um, w times in which women are not allowed to participate in education. Afghanistan has a better part, and we've left the women uh, in uh, alert. Yeah, we left them alone. One has to be frank in saying that. We have not kept the promises we made. And at times like these, it's important that this feminist foreign policy is a promise that will be uh, kept. And what it means is something that we together will have to, in a way, um, uh, make come true in the years to come. Thus, um, everyone has to engage. That is my invitation here. Uh, we need your support. It has to be an optimistic and positive approach that welcomes this policy, because these women there and the men too need you. Thank you. I think that that was uh, an excellent concluding remark uh, for 
the events of today where the feminist foreign policy guidelines were presented to you. Thank you, Madam Minister, for your contribution. Thank you for the time you um, spent with us, listening to us, discussing with us. Thank you to all of you who've come here, shown up in great numbers to attend this event. Thank you to those who I don't know um, where are out there following us by video link. The Federal Foreign Office has the great honor, and I thought at first it was a joke, um, because I was told afterwards, yeah, they'll invite you for a glass of champagne. No, this is true. You are invited to enjoy a glass of champagne, a cup of coffee or tea, and a piece of cake. Take these guidelines with you. Spread them. Spread the news. Show them to your friends, all those who only have a very vague idea of what foreign policy is about. It's not designed to remain in the Berlin bubble, but we want it to go to all corners of the world. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for having contributed. That goes to the panelists today. Thank you.